talk about the covenants of Scripture. First of all, we talked about what the key verse is, um, and it's Deuteronomy 7, 9. So if you, if you can turn there, I just want to read that Scripture. That's sort of been the, the theme Scripture that we've been, that we're basing this entire study on. Um, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Deuteronomy 7, 9. So here, here's what Deuteronomy 7, 9 says. It says, Therefore, know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for how many? A thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Remember we talked uh, in the last class about the fact that when He says a thousand generations, when he gets to 999, he's not going to say, well, we got one more to go. Mm -hmm. That term, a thousand generation, means forever. Forever. He keeps his covenant with his people forever. Okay. And, and before we get into the real content of it, I want to challenge you to think about uh, covenant on different levels. Think about covenant from the perspective of, first of all, what Scripture has to say about the covenants and the promises that God has made to us. But... Also, think about coming from the perspective of when you've been in your time of prayer and in your time of spending uh, uh, devotional time with the Lord, the Lord has spoken some things to you. The Lord has said some things to you. His, his covenants revealed to you in a personal sense um, are just as strong as His covenants revealed in a written capacity. So, think about that. So, by way of review covenant, anybody want to take a stab at what that word covenant means? We talked about what the word covenant means. Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, the, discussion about, the discussion about covenant last time was that it says to between two people, mm -hmm. if one person don't uphold their part, the other person, is gonna, uh, God's going to uphold his part. Whether you do, whether you suppose, what you're supposed to do or not, he's going to love you and care for you and, and heal you and, and provide for you anyway. That is absolutely a part of the definition of covenant. That's when we talked a little bit about the covenant versus contract. The English, English word for covenant simply means, and when we use the term covenant, it means a mutual understanding. It's a mutual agreement or understanding between two parties, and each person binds themselves to that covenant. But remember, remember we talked about how covenant speaks to us in different ways depending upon which language we read it in. Right. So in the Hebrew, berith, the, the word covenant means what? A cutting. cutting. It means that something has to be cut and some blood has to be let. Okay? It's a flesh cut, that word covenant. And um, we talked about one of the examples that um, they gave that um, in the, their covenants between uh, friends, 1 Samuel 18.3, between Jonathan and David. They were friends. There was a covenant there. But then we look at the Greek word for covenant. The Greek word for covenant actually means testament or will. So when you say Old Testament, New Testament, you're really saying Old Covenant or New Covenant. That's what the Greek word means. Hebrews 7, 22, uh, the writer says, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Better testament. And we took time to talk about the beauty of that word better. Testament um, that the writer talks about there. We don't have time to cover it tonight. More to what Brother Izzar was saying, we also talked about the fact there's a difference between a contract and a covenant. Even though we use the terms interchangeably, there's a difference. Now, the contract is basically an agreement where if uh, there are two parties that come into agreement, but in a contract, if one party breaks that contract, don't uphold that part of the contract, the contract becomes void. Yeah. All right? None of it is in effect anymore. Whereas with a covenant, covenant says that um, when those two parties come into agreement, based on the, the, the terms of that covenant, when those two parties come into agreement, if one party does not uphold their end of that covenant, guess what? The other party still has full responsibility to uphold their end. And that speaks of grace, because we fail our end of the covenant all the time. We started off failing. The Bible says that God made man, created man out of the dust of the earth. 
we were perfect and in, in the form of Adam. Adam started off failing. And so Jesus had to come from the very beginning just to establish what he, the writer of Hebrew calls a better covenant. And that better covenant is, is the one that we live under, that we walk under at this point now. So we have to think in covenant thinking. Remember we talked about the fact that we think like contract. We think in the contract line. You let me down, I don't, I, then I let you down. You don't uphold your end of the bargain, I'm not obliged to uphold my end of the bargain. But, but the Bible gives us a definition that's very different than that. And some of what we talk about even Sunday, how we sometimes gauge our relationships based on contract thinking versus covenant thinking. Mm -hmm. We gauge our marriages based on contract thinking versus covenant thinking. If you don't do what I think you should do, then I have a right to respond in this way or that way. Mm -hmm. Versus the covenant relationship that says I'm committed. No matter what, I'm committed. Period. I would love for you to do what you should do. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you do what you're supposed to do. I'm going to give you all the help I can give you to make sure you fulfill your, your, your aspect of the obligation. But whether you do or not, I made a vow. Yes. And I'm committed. All right? So that's the difference between covenant thinking and contract thinking. And, and, and the beauty about covenant is covenant is liberating. Mm. It's liberating because it's freedom. It's freedom in Christ to know that while I may fall, I may not, I may miss the mark. He is not going to give up on me just because I missed the mark. Mm -hmm. He's still going to fulfill every aspect of what he promised to me uh, as my Savior, despite the fact that I, that from time to time, missed the mark. All right, enough review. Just wanted to kind of refresh your mind and get you back in the thought process. All right, so tonight we're going to kind of pick up tonight on... Um, Different types of covenants. Now we're still in the actual introduction phase of this. So we haven't gotten to the actual covenants yet. We're going to cover eight covenants in Scripture. But still kind of laying the groundwork here and, and just giving you some understanding of how covenant works. So first of all, there are two types of covenants. All right, two types of covenants we're going to talk about tonight. Talk about the difference between. Them. First, there's the conditional covenant and there's the unconditional covenant. In the conditional covenant, this is what a conditional covenant is. A conditional covenant is, I'm going to use a big word here, but, but I'm going to explain, is a bilateral agreement. It's an agreement where two parties, by means two, two parties come into agreement with one another. All right? The scripture is, has conditional covenants and it has unconditional covenants. And it's important for us to know the difference. It's important for us to know which, which ones are which. So it's an agreement where two people come and the, the primary thought in this agreement is, if you do this, then I will do that. If you do this, then I will do that. That's a conditional covenant. Some people claim the promises from Scripture. Certain promises from Scripture, they claim them as theirs, but they forget the fact that that's conditional. Mm -hmm. That's based on the fact that if you do what God says do, then you will get this. Then you will get that. It's not just automatic because you pray and rub the, rub the genie bottle a couple of times, a couple of times and boom, it's going to happen. So we have to understand how that works. This is in, in a conditional covenant, it's what God promises to grant special blessings to, to a, a person or to people, providing those people fulfill those certain conditions. Turn to Exodus chapter 19. I want to show you an example of a conditional covenant, conditional promise that God made. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. This is after Israel has been free from Egyptian bondage, and they're in the wilderness, and God is having a conversation with them. I'm going to read verses 3 through 6. The writer, the writer says, uh, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Listen, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Listen, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments, then... You shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. I want to give you another example. Turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. This is one that all of us have heard. We've all heard it preached. I've preached it. Uh, we've heard others preach it. Deuteronomy, chapter 28. 
Deuteronomy 20, 28, verse 1 says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations. And then he goes down through all the blessings. You'll be blessed, and, you, and the blessings shall come upon you, and it will take you because you obey the voice of your Lord. And we go down the list of all the blessings. Now, how many know that many people, they claim blessings from God all the time, but they skip over the part that says, if you obey me, if you fulfill my will, if you do what I've called you and asked you to do, then you will partake in receiving these blessings. And sometimes people say, oh, God has just forgotten about me. God is, is, is not you know, going to fulfill what he said. And then oftentimes we have to take inventory and say, but have, have we fulfilled what God has, has required of us? This, this was a... This was a a beautiful, tremendous uh, pronouncement of blessing in the book of Deuteronomy where he says, I'll bless you in all of these ways, but we can't skip verse 1. Well, he says, if you obey my voice. And then we cannot skip verse 15. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully in his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be. Mm. And for the next several words, curse shall you be, curse shall you be, curse shall you be. From now, now don't don't get this don't get this confused. I'm not saying that God goes around cursing people. I understand we're living under the New Testament. We're living, living under the New Covenant, but there are things that God requires of us in order for us to experience the benefits of His blessing. All right, those are conditional covenants. Um, I've heard people say in the past, and I don't believe it's biblical. I've heard people teach and say that you know what. It really don't matter what you do because if God has got a plan for you, it's going to come to pass. <laughs> now that sounds very inspirational. It sounds very religious. And it sounds very spiritual, but it ain't biblical. Yeah. A lot of people have died prematurely because they've chosen not to do what God told them to do. A lot of people have not experienced the benefits and the blessings of what God has for them because they've decided that they're not going to heed the voice of the Lord. You can say, and I can say all day long, you know what, if God has it for you, what God has for me is for me. Yes, what God has for me is for me. But there may be some conditions on me obtaining it. There may be some conditions on me obtaining it. So I can't just rest and say, well, it don't matter, no matter what happens. If it's it meant to be, it's going to happen. If it's meant to be, it's going to happen. Yes, if my desire is for God's will to be fulfilled in my life, then that's a condition. Then yes, if it's meant to be, it will happen. If I'm willing to do what God has called me to do, I'm willing to move and pursue in the direction of what God has called me to do, then yes, if it's meant to be, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. But for me to just sit and say, well, <clears throat> if it's meant to be, it's going to happen, um, I, don't, I don't believe that's biblical. The other, the, the other one is the unconditional covenants. The unconditional covenants. Unconditional covenants are what we call unilateral. It's just one. It's an unconditional covenant is a covenant that God makes in and of himself. And the amazing thing about God's covenant is that uh, he has the power and the ability to not only make the covenant, but to enforce the covenant all by himself. It's a covenant that just says simply, I will. There's no if you do, then I will do. It's a, simple, it's a covenant that simply says, I will. Let me tell you a word, if you're taking notes, that you can put beside unconditional covenant. You can put it in parentheses. Grace. Grace. Unconditional covenant. You will never, ever live up to my expectations. You'll never, ever fulfill the law. You'll never, ever fulfill the requirements of the law. But because of my love for you, I still call you my own. I still call you my own. Unconditional covenant. In a more pure sense, let's look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Genesis 12, 1 through 6. This is one we're all familiar with. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed, the Lord, as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from 
Haran. Then Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree uh, of Morah, and the Canaanites were there, were, were, were then in the land. God didn't say to Abraham, if you do this, then I'm going to do that. God simply said, get out from your father's house, and I'm, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make a great nation of you. All right? I'm going to do this. Matthew 26, 28. Matthew 26, 28. You can write this down. If you can't get to it, just, just, just write it down. Matthew 26, 28. This speaks of the new covenant, which we're going to get to at some point begin to talk about. It says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for, the, for, for many for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. The blood of the new covenant. All right? That's a unilateral thing. There was nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do to impact the blood of Jesus that was shed. Nothing. We have no, we have no control. We have no bearing on it. Conditional covenants. In a conditional covenant, as I said before, conditional covenant, man's failure to fulfill that covenant results in punishment. Man's result to... When, 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 when God spoke to uh, Adam and Eve and he said, I, you listen, you can eat from any tree in this garden. But this one tree, I don't want you to eat. They decided to disobey that. That resulted in punishment. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. So uh, a conditional covenant results in, pun in punishment. It brings a conditional covenant brings either blessings or cursings. Cursings. How many covenants did we say that there are a total in the scripture that we're going to talk about? Eight. There are eight of them. <clears throat> Two of the eight covenants in the Bible are conditional. Two of the eight are conditional. Anybody venture to guess which ones? Say again. Mosaic is definitely one of them. Absolutely. Pastor Joe, you can't answer. Pastor <laughs> Yes, the Mosaic one is one. Was one, there's one a little earlier than that. Just give me again. The Edenic covenant. Those are the two covenants that are actually conditional. All right, I read one already, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. That's the Mosaic covenant. All right. Now, on the other hand, the unconditional covenants, I told you that word, when you hear the word unconditional, you got to think of that one word. Grace. The unconditional covenant, these are secured by the grace of God. That means you cannot live up to the standard that's required in order for you to reap the benefits of that covenant. There are many conditions, conditions in the covenant by which God requested, requests the covenanted one to fulfill uh, the, these conditions, but he requests you to fulfill them out of your gratitude and your heart of love towards him. He, he doesn't force you to do it. He requests you to do it out of your love. But they are not themselves the basis. In other words, if you decide that you don't love God, that's not a basis for him to undo his blood. Mm. Thank you, God. Okay? How many of the eight covenants are actually unconditional? Six. Six. <laughs> that's what I make sure you listen. That's a test. If, if, listen, if you, if you didn't answer that one right, I would be a little disappointed. Like, oh, mercy, I don't, maybe I just need to sit down. <laughs> Six, the Adamic covenant, Adam, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian or land covenant, which we talked about, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. Those are the unconditional covenants. Aren't you glad there's more unconditional covenants than there are conditional ones? <laughs> I'm so glad this is, there's more <laughs> there's more unconditional covenants than there are conditional covenants. All right, this is listen, and I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take this uh, slow enough that everyone can really sink their teeth into this. It is amazing how everything that God does in Scripture ties all together. It's amazing how everything He institutes and constitutes. In the word of God. Really sometimes we can read it. It can seem like so scattered. But all of it relates. In some way shape or form. Listen to this. Each divine covenant. Each divine covenant. Has three parts. Each divine covenant has three parts. First of all. They are the words. Of these, this covenant. Now just stick with me. I told you the first couple of. Classes are going to be really kind of like details and all that before we get into the covenant because I want you to be able to appreciate the understanding of these covenants when we get there. They have, you have the words of the covenant. 
Who gives the words of the covenant? God. You have the blood of the covenant. In each of these eight covenants, you have the blood of the covenant. Who gives that? God the Son. And you have the seal of the covenant. God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, the words of the covenant, he's the one that speaks the words. He speaks the words that make up the covenants that he's given to us. You have the blood of the covenant, that's God the Son, right? Mm -hmm. The covenant was sealed by his blood, right? Mm -hmm. The Old Testament was covered. In, in the Old Testament, um, how, how, did they, how did they live up to that? And they had to shed blood, right? Mm -hmm. The Old Testament, they had to actually shed blood. It was covered by the blood. In the New Testament, it was fulfilled by the blood. Mm -hmm. All right? It was fulfilled by the blood. And then the seal of the, the, the covenant, which is the Holy Spirit. I want to, I want to show you 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me read that. Write that down. 2 Corinthians, when you're doing your Bible study, you can read that. 2 Corinthians 1, 22, I'm sorry, 21 and 22. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, this is what it says. Listen, now he who establishes us with, uh, with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Listen, when God gave us the covenants, the triune God gave us triune covenants. Mm -hmm. All of the covenants had some aspect of the Godhead represented and reflected in them. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each person of the Godhead had a part in the making of the ratifying and the sealing of the covenant. Let me, let me explain it. The making of the covenant is the one who sits down and is the author of it, who writes it. And then the ratifying, when, when you ratify a covenant, that means that it's signed and it's all now in effect. The one that makes it effective, that's the blood of Jesus. And then the one who seals it, the one who seals it, makes it formal. Say, this is done. It's the Holy Spirit. So the, the Trinity is reflected in every single one of the covenants. Now let's look at each of these. What constitutes covenant? We talked about the fact that the covenant has words, right? The words of the covenant. The words of the covenant, it's an expressed agreement that's verbalized and written, uh, or ver verbalized or written, a writing involving the promises, the terms, or the oath. So the words of the covenant... I talk about Deuteronomy 28. Just from what you, you know from hearing that scripture, what are some of the words of that covenant? Blessing. Blessing. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead and say some of them. You don't have to say them in order. It's okay. Just, if, you, if, you, if you know any of them. Bless, 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 bless shall you be in the city. Blessed are in the field. Blessed will be the fruit of your womb. Blessed be uh, your back, so run over. What all of the blessings that are spoken of in Deuteronomy? Those are the words of the, of, the, of the promise. But also, there's what else in the promises? There's some blessings. What else is there? There's some curses. If you don't obey them, then what? Curse shall you be in all these things. All right. So the words of the covenant are important. But then the words actually also relate to the terms. Mm -hmm. What are the terms of the covenant in Deuteronomy 28? Well, let's turn back. It's on, it's, 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 verse 1. Go ahead and read it. Yes. Obey the voice of the Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Now, it shall come to pass, if you diligently mm -hmm. obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully mm -hmm. all his commandments, which I command you today. These are the conditions, mm -hmm. the terms. Now, I know a lot of people would, would, would be in here tonight saying, why are you taking time to go through all of this? Because as, as people of God, if we don't understand this, we just freely and ignorantly quote scripture and claim stuff that we don't even know how to lay hold to, mm -hmm. to lay claim to. So, he says in the terms, here's, 
Here are the terms of the covenant. Here's what you have to do. Now, here, here is the interesting thing when we get to the actual oath of the covenant. Here's the interesting thing of in the oath of the covenant. The oath of the covenant, let's, let's first, um, the, the, the oath of the covenant is irrevocable. You, you can't take it back. It's, it's not taken back. Once you make it, it's made. That's, the English word for oath is, it means solemn affirmation with an appeal to God for his truth. But the, 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 the other word is shibuwa. Try to say that. <laughs> shibuwa. It means something sworn. It means to be complete. Another word for it is horkos. Horkos, that means actually offense. Offense. Or a limit to which you can go. It's an oath given one's word which binds them until its fulfillment. What it is attached to, well, a covenant is irrevocable. Covenant is irrevocable. Hebrews 6, 13. Here's what it says. Write that down. For when God made promises to Abraham, listen to this. This is how this is when we say that this is a Abraham was a was an unconditional covenant. When God made promises to Abraham because he could not swear because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. He swore unto himself. He made an oath, and it was irrevocable. It wasn't changed. And we'll give you some examples of some oaths. So we can talk about this fact of what it means for it to be actually irrevocable. All right? I'm going to give you some examples. Turn to Joshua 2, chapter 2. We read a lot of scriptures tonight. We're in Bible study. So Joshua chapter 2. Pastor Joe, will you read verses 17 through 24? The men, the men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window. Throw through which you let, let us down. Unless you have brought your father and mother, your brother and all your family into your house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. He will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if the hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we'll be released from the oath and you made that you made us swear. Amen. Wow. So that's obviously the spies that were talking to who? Rahab. Mm -hmm. You remember when they were told to go spy on the land? Mm -hmm. And they came in contact with Rahab. And Rahab was actually, there's a whole other lesson, a sermon you can, you can really just pull from this, is that Rahab was what? She was a harlot. She was a prostitute. Rahab was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And, and when they went to the, the, the land to spy it out, isn't it interesting that they, the, the one person they befriended, have found favor with, was a prostitute? Talk about grace. Talk about uh, covenant. Talk about all these things. And isn't it interesting that the one person they chose to make covenant with while they were there was a prostitute? And isn't it interesting that you can take this Old Testament story and actually see the fingerprints of grace, the New Testament, all in it. They said, we'll make this covenant with you that if you will actually, uh, when we come in to destroy this place, if you put what color? Red. 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 A scarlet is the word, the description of red for the blood of Jesus. If you put, that'll be the sign. That'll be the sign that you are heeding what we're saying, and guess what? You'll be saved. Mm -hmm. Representative of when the uh, children of Israel were in Exodus, uh, in Exodus, in Egypt, and the Bible says that when the death angel came, he said, if you put the blood over the door mantle, then I'll pass over you. So Rahab, you a harlot, you don't deserve anything that's good. In fact, we're coming to destroy this land. And by all human standards, by contract thinking, really you should be one of the first destroyed based on your mm -hmm. lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But if you put this blood colored, whew, I feel like preaching on that one. <laughs> if you put this blood colored scarlet out your window and let that be seen, that'll be a sign to us. And when we come to destroy the land, we'll destroy everybody that saved you. 
grace. Grace. But at the same time, in a literal sense, it was an oath. It was an oath. In Numbers 30, verse 2, it says, If a man vow vow unto the Lord and swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. And in a covenant, the oath is irrevocable. It's irrevocable. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 9, I won't take time to read it all. Do you remember the story of John the Baptist? Mm -hmm. How he was beheaded? Remember the king made a promise? And, and because John the Baptist had rebuked his family for engaging in sin, his, was it his brother-in-law's wife? Or he, he, he said, you ought not do this. And when the king was celebrating, he said, tell me one thing I can give to you. Mm -hmm. She was angry because John had rebuked him. She said, give me John's, her daughter actually, mm -hmm. went to the king and said, give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. I want you to cut his head off. I want you to put him on a platter. He said, so be it. But look at what, look at what Matthew 14, 9. Now this is the king. And sometimes we're really, we can be really hard on the king. And, and maybe it's justified. But well, look at what verse four, uh, Matthew 14 9 says. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake. What is that? For the oath's sake. It meant that once the king gave his word, his entire credibility of his kingship was predicated on his willingness to adhere to the oath. And if he were to go back on his oath, it would totally reflect, lose credibility in his, in his authority. So because his heart was sorry, and because he didn't want to do it, he had to do it because of the oath he made. It was irrevocable. Don't we know another story? That's exactly right. That's Daniel in the lion's den. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to put him in there. But he, he had said, if this happens, I'm going to put you in there. And, that, and the Bible said that man was up all night long because he couldn't change the oath all he knew to do was pray. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why the next morning he went down and he said, what's going on? Daniel said, old king, live forever. Oh, yeah. Live forever. Don't worry. Everything is all right. <laughs> and the king got saved instantly. Yeah. Got saved immediately. He said, at first I was telling everybody they need to, they need to bow to me, pray to me. He said, but now the God of Daniel, <laughs> the Lord, the God of Daniel, <laughs> I, I, I bring those scriptures out because that's the power of an oath. So when God makes a promise to us, he has every one of these elements. He has the promises, the words, he has the terms, and he makes an oath. It's irrevocable. It's irrevocable. It cannot change. It cannot change. Remember we talked about the beauty of the fact that six of the eight covenants are actually unconditional. So that cannot change, will not change, shall not change. We could take time, we don't have time, but we will talk about some of the things that's going on in the Middle East right now. Some of the promises, all of the promises, that God made to his people seem in some ways as if they may be in jeopardy based upon what's happening in current events. Mm -hmm. But you can hang your hat on the fact that what God has promised will come to pass. Yes. It will come to pass. No man or woman can stop it. It's going to come to pass one way or the other. It can come to pass with America on board. Or it can come to pass without us. But it's going to come to pass. The blood. We talked about the words. What about the blood? The blood represents... What, what does the blood represent? Um... First of all, what does the blood represent? And this will talk about what it represents in the covenant. Le turn to Leviticus. Like, I told you you can't answer that, Joe. <laughs> turn to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. <laughs> the walking Bible was sitting in here passing Joe, so you know, we can't really so we let him answer. It's unfair because he always knows the answer. <laughs> That's a blessing. Praise the Lord. Leviticus 17, 11. When somebody gets there, just read it out for me real loud. 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Amen. The blood represents, in the covenant, the blood represents the life commitment of those involved. It represents the life commitment of those involved. Blood represents life. That's why we talk so much about the blood. That's why we plead the blood. We pray that God cover us with the blood. We pray that he protect us through his blood. It represents life. The sacrifice of a covenant. The sacrifice of a covenant. The sacrifice of a covenant was the blood, the body of Christ, and his blood that was shed. That's the sacrifice of the covenant. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time when I got four minutes. <laughs> the mediator of a covenant. Hebrews 4.14. Listen to what Hebrews 4.14 says. Now, before, before, I, before I read Hebrews 4.14, do you know, you know who the mediators were in the Old Testament? The mediators in the Old Testament were the priests. They were the high priests. They were the people that represented the people to God. They would go to the people on behalf, go to God on behalf of the people. So they would mediate. They would be the go-between, if you will. But Hebrews 4.14 says, See, and then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. There's no... He, he says exactly who it is. Jesus, Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but in all, was in all points tempted like as we yet without sin. You know, you know why I thank God for the mediator of the covenant? Because Jesus' job was not just a down. Did you, you know, you ever heard the term, a man's job is never done? No. <laughs> Listen, listen, there's nobody that values more, more values so greatly uh, the, the role and the conviction that a woman has, especially single moms. I do, I salute you. But the saying is a man's job is never done. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> man's job is never done. Uh, I, I know that woman's job is never done. Also. But 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 whoever who what is it what is it? Pastor one verse. But, but whoever chose to coin that phrase decided to coin it. A man's job is never done. We can we can interpret a woman's job is never done as well. I'm gonna keep on going because y'all know. I keep right on going. Yeah, I'll start stuff. I ain't going. Going, going. Man's job is never done. A person's job is never done. Woman's job is never done. I never it. Uh, Jesus' job is never done. Amen. Amen. He died on the cross mm -hmm. two thousand years ago. But how many know before he ever died on the cross, he was busy being God. Yes. Yeah. He was busy sitting on the throne in heaven overseeing his creation. And then he decided that because uh, with, with him, through his interaction with God the Father, he decided I need to leave my throne and I need to go into the form of a man. So he came through the, he came through the womb of a woman. And coming through the womb of a woman, he grew, he became a child. And he lived like we live. And Hebrews is talking about that. He says in all points he was tempted like us, yet he was without sin. Mm -hmm. And as he grew up and became a man, then he entered into his ministry. Ultimately, he came to the place where he was to fulfill his ultimate purpose for coming to this earth. That was to die on the cross. That was a representation of two things. It was a representation of the end and a representation of the beginning. The, the, the last breath he breathed on the cross when he said, before he, when he, after he said it is finished, was one of the first breaths he would ever breathe to offer eternal salvation to mankind. <coughs> And so he died on the cross, he rose again, he came back, he interacted with the disciples and people, and the Bible says he ascended back into heaven. Would have been nice for him to go back into heaven, take his throne, his seat on the throne, and say, whew, I'm done. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the writer of Hebrews gives us some good news. He says, he is the mediator. We have a high priest 
that is always touched by the feelings of our infirmities. What does that mean? You have to read all the scripture to really get the full meaning of what he's saying. Not only is he here our high priest, but he's our intercessor. He's our mediator. He's, he's the one that goes. So what that means is this. I got to close on this. What that means is this. It means that not only was he being God before he came to earth to die for us, not only did he come to this earth and go through the form of a man and die on the cross for us, and not only did he go back to heaven and assume his rightful place at the right hand of the Father, but it means now he sits from heaven and he looks at the covenants that have been instituted by his God, by our God, by his Father, and he says to him, my job was done in earth, but now my job is to now mediate on behalf of my people. Mm -hmm. So what he does is when you fall and I fall, he says, God, Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. Remember, I died for you. Mm -hmm. Remember, my blood was shed for them. Mm -hmm. You have to be true Mm -hmm. to your word to them. Mm -hmm. Lord, I know they let you down this time again, (laughs) but they're asking for forgiveness, God. And you know, when you look at them, you see my blood. Mm -hmm. When you look at them, you see Rahab. Rahab. Mm -hmm. We're we're Rahab. Mm -hmm. We're Rahab, but when you look at them, you see the scarlet that's, that's, that's over them. You see that scarlet thread that's over them, and you see my blood. So Jesus is constantly and continually mediating Thank you, God. the covenant for us. The covenant never just sits idle, and God looks at the covenant and says, yeah, I wrote the words, and I don't know you let me down. But Jesus is constantly playing both sides. Amen. He's constantly saying to God the Father, you know you wrote these words, and he's coming to us and saying, that just hang in a little bit longer. He's been praying, and he's saying, I forgive you, and he goes back to God. He's mediating. That's his job. That's what he does. That's why the words of Hebrews is so special. When you read those words, that's the picture you need to see. You need to see somebody standing in the gap and playing both sides. It's represented in the scripture when he said, I sought for a man, someone who would stand in the gap. But I found out Jesus is that one that will stand in the gap and be a mediator. Did you know that the word intercessor literally means Stand in the gap. It means gap filler. That's what the word intercessor literally means. Gap filler. It means the chasm, the separation that's between us and God on every level. Jesus fills that gap. And so the writer, when he says to the the people, he's reading to them, because remember, they're coming from a perspective and a mindset where they remember the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and how things had to be filled from the Old Covenant. But he writes to them and says, remember now, he says, see that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. He fulfilled everything he's supposed to do. Now he's back in heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. In other words, you uphold your end. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our firm. He not only is praying and mediating for you, he actually has empathy and he understands. He knows what you're feeling. He knows that when you were tempted, that not just that you did the act, but he knows all of the emotion that went into what you did. That went into what you said. That went into what you thought. He understands the whole picture. He says, so he's one that, we don't have one that can't be touched with fills our firmness, but he in all points was tempted like we. Yet, he was without sin. Mm-hmm. Yet he was without sin. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. It also, the blood also relates to the sanctuary of the covenant. Mm-hmm. In the Old Testament, they had a tabernacle. In the Old Testament, they had a place they would go in order to sacrifice. <coughs> but the New Testament, <coughs> 1 Corinthians, know ye not that you are the temple. Okay. Of the Holy Spirit. Mm. That tabernacle is now represented and embodied in us. Mm. It's embodied in us. I want to go on, but I'm not. I can I can save the rest for next week. We'll pick up on the sanctuary of the covenant for next week as we go into uh, the rest of it. But bear in mind and keep in mind that as we talk about the covenant of Scripture, that, that they're much more than just merely some words or some promises that God made to us. He put his whole essence of who he is into. The triune God is represented in the covenants. Everything that he said uh, is he, he, he put himself into it to make it forceful and effective for us. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Any, any questions?